the ancient Greeks treated astronomy as a branch of mathematics. They saw a geometrical model for celestial phenomena. The early Greeks, we can see in Hesiod, the historian, and Homer, were influenced by Phoenician sailors and literate Babylonians and Arameans. We begin with Thales of Miletus, who lived in the 7th and 6th centuries BC. He calculated the duration of the year and the timings of equinoxes and solstices. But even more significantly, he predicted a solar eclipse. This would have been the solar eclipse that happened on May 28th, 585 BC. We know that because there was a battle going on and they saw the solar eclipse and took it as a sign that they should stop fighting and signed a truce. Now, we do not know how Thales predicted this eclipse, but Isaac Asimov calls this the birth of science. The sixth century BC was also the time of the Pythagoreans, followers of Pythagoras. They shared a few doctrines in their cult society. First, metempsychosis, the doctrine that souls are immortal and that after death, soul will go from one body into another. Their doctrine of numerology they used mathematics for mystical reasons. They taught that everything was made of numbers. They held that three was the perfect number because it had a beginning, a middle, and an end. The sacred symbol of the Pythagoreans was the tetractus, which spelled in Greek letters here. And the symbol was a triangle of four dots on the bottom, then three, two, and one. So an equilateral triangle, four on any side, on the outside, we have one dot in the very middle. Another doctrine of the Pythagoreans was their mysticism or their sense of harmony of the spheres. They held that the planets move according to mathematical equations and thus resonate to produce an inaudible symphony of music. This vision of the cosmos and cosmic order foreshadows Kepler's views. We can also think of the Pythagoreans as doing early quadrivium studies. They learned arithmetic and geometry in order to apply them to music and astronomy. A few astronomical discoveries from either the Pythagoreans or from Parmenides, who was alive at the same time but was not a Pythagorean, are that the Earth is spherical and that was known through lunar eclipses that the Earth has five climatic zones. It's possible that they just got lucky with this one. The five climatic zones we recognize today are one close to the equator, the torrid zone, two, one at each pole, the frigid zones, and the ones in between torrid and frigid, the temperate zones. At this time, they also realized that what was considered the morning star and the evening star are actually the same object, the planet Venus. In the following century, we have the astronomer Meton of Athens. The Metonic cycle is named after him. Although he probably got this knowledge from the Babylonians, the key point is that 19 tropical years or solar years based on the seasons, and 235 lunar months, according to the phases of the moon, are approximately equal. He had approximated this cycle to 6,940 days. This means that a given day of a lunar month 
occurs on the same day of the solar year as it did 19 years before, but it's not exact. Mitan also found the dates of equinoxes and solstices by observing sunrise from his observatory. About a generation later, Plato came along. Plato was influenced, of course, by Socrates, but also by the Pythagoreans. Plato is one of the greatest philosophers of all time and founded the Academy at Athens. He wrote many dialogues in which Socrates is his main character. The Timaeus is one of his dialogues. Socrates doesn't say a whole lot in the Timaeus, but he's listening to Timaeus, who talks about how the world was created. Plato's idea was that there are two worlds. We have the physical world, where we live, but there's also an eternal world, the world of the forms. Plato felt that because change occurs in the physical world, in a description of the physical world, one should not look for anything more than a likely account. The demiurge or maker of the physical world must have looked at the eternal world as he was fashioning the physical world. The creation of the universe is certainly the handiwork of a divine craftsman. And the demiurge wanted there to be good in the world. So the demiurge brings order out of chaos. He makes the world a living creature. He created a single unique world, not many worlds. The world has four elements, earth, air, fire, and water, for proper harmony and proportion. The world is spherical because the sphere is the perfect shape. And the world is assigned circular motion because that is the most appropriate for mind and intelligence. The world soul is composed of sameness, difference, and being. It describes the orbits of the heavenly bodies as seven unequal circles. Three of them with equal speeds, the sun, Mercury, and Venus, and four with unequal speeds, the moon, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. These motions repeat every complete or perfect year, which must have been a much longer cycle than a normal Earth year. The elements are composed of perfect solids. These are also called the platonic solids. The dodecahedron is also a perfect solid, but is left out here. But that represents the shape of the universe. Now of the other four platonic solids, three of them, the tetrahedron, icosahedron, and octahedron, are all composed of faces of equilateral triangles. And then we also have the cube. Out of the other four platonic solids, the tetrahedron, octahedron, and icosahedron are all composed of faces of equilateral triangles. An equilateral triangle can be bisected into two equal triangles that are 30, 60, 90 triangles. And then the cube is composed of fa six faces of squares, and the square can be cut into two equal triangles that are also right and are 45, 45, 90 triangles. So the elements are composed of perfect solids that are composed of these two fundamental triangles. Eudoxus of Cnidus, who taught at Plato's Academy, was a great mathematician and emphasized the roles of geometry and proportions. He wrote astronomical texts on eclipses in eight year lunisolar Venus cycle, spherical astronomy and planetary motions. His was the first mathematical model of planetary motion. He used nested spheres centered on the Earth to explain planetary motion. Three spheres for the moon, one for the, its daily motion, 
two for its monthly motion, three spheres for the sun, one for its daily motion, one for its annual motion, and one other, four spheres for each of the five visible planets, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn, one for its daily motion, one for its motion through the zodiac constellations, and two for its retrograde motion. And then one sphere for the fixed stars. So we get 27 total spheres. This model was unable to predict motions exactly. And the model held that the planets are always the same distance from Earth. So that didn't really explain changes in brightness or speed. Next, we have Callipus of Sisychus. He was one of the students of Eudoxus of Cnidus, and he also worked with Aristotle at the Lyceum, who we will talk about next. Callipus also used nested spheres to explain planetary motion, but he needed to add a few more. He added two more for the Sun, one more for the Moon, one more for each of Mercury, Venus, and Mars. Callipus also measured the seasons, the days between solstices and equinoxes, and found that they were not equal. Callipus also expanded the work of Meton of Athens and proposed what we now call the Callipic cycle. The Callipic cycle consists of four metonic cycles, but with the last day of the fourth removed so that it would synchronize with the seasons better. He started his observation cycle on the summer solstice in 330 BC. Aristotle was a student at Plato's Academy at first, and then became one of the greatest philosophers of all time. He was one of the first people to study plants, animals, and people in a scientific way. He founded his own school, the Lyceum, also known as the Peripatetic School, because they would walk around as they taught. When we speak of Aristotle's physics, it's not the same meaning that we give to modern physics. Physics for Aristotle is more like a philosophy of nature. Aristotle set out to find the principles of change, which in turn would be the principles of being. He talks about different types of change, change in place, locomotion, change in quality, change in quantity, growth or diminution, and change in substance generation and corruption. Eventually, he comes up with the principles of change and being as matter, form, and privation. In every change, there's something that changes and something that stays the same. There is a form that is acquired at the end of the change that was not there at the beginning. So at the beginning, there was the privation of that form and then the acquisition of the form at the end of that motion. But there's also something that underlies the change. This primary substratum is matter. Matter and form also appear in Aristotle's causes. His four causes were the material, formal, efficient, and final causes. These four causes give a complete answer to the question why. The material cause is that of which a thing is made. The formal cause is the essential property that makes a thing what it is. The efficient cause is the agent. The final cause is the purpose or that for the sake of which a thing is. Aristotle describes the structure of the cosmos in the same way as Eudoxus and Callipus with concentric spheres centered on the earth. But for Aristotle, the earth is at the center because of the four elements and because they seek their natural place. Because earth is the heaviest of the four, its natural motion is down and its natural place is at the center. And then water is the next heavy of the four elements. Water also goes down, but doesn't tend down as much as Earth. So the natural place of water would be on top of the Earth. Then the next would be air. And so we would get air on top of the water and then fire 
the natural place of fire is outside of the air. So fire's natural motion is up until it gets to its natural place. These four elements were considered corruptible, subject to change. But the stars and planets seemed to be incorruptible. So Aristotle considered that they were composed of a fifth element, ether, that is incorruptible and moves in a circular motion because that is the perfect shape. Aristotle included unrolling spheres between each set of spheres to cancel out the motions of the outer set. Each sphere requires an unmoved mover and the outermost sphere of the fixed stars is moved by the prime mover. Another idea Aristotle had about motion that proved out to be incorrect is that the speed of falling bodies is proportional to their weight and inversely proportional to the density of the medium through which they are falling. Aristotle held that a vacuum or void was impossible because the speed of a falling object would become infinite. Because Aristotle was such a great philosopher and scientist in many disciplines, his views on cosmology were kept in Western tradition for many centuries. He did have a couple of other contributions to astronomy as well. He refuted Democritus's idea that the stars of the Milky Way are in Earth's shadow and said that if the sun is larger than the Earth, then the stars of the Milky Way must be really far away. Aristotle also had arguments for a round Earth. One was from lunar eclipses. Another argument was that if you observe stars from different latitudes, the angles at which the stars are in the sky are different. And that only makes sense on a sphere. Aristotle also realized that geological changes are too slow for a person to observe over his lifetime. For example, the drying up of lakes or when a desert gives way to a river such as the Nile. The idea that the sun could be the center of the universe was not entirely absent from the ancient Greeks. About a century before Aristarchus of Samos was Heraclides Ponticus, who proposed that the earth rotated daily. He also might have been the one to first propose the heliocentric model, but the first one we have evidence of for proposing that the sun is the center of the universe is Aristarchus of Samos. The reason Aristarchus came to this conclusion is based on his estimates for the relative sizes of the sun, moon, and earth. He tried to guess the angles of the triangle formed when the moon is a half moon to be able to know how much farther away the sun is than the moon. His estimate was that it's 20 times farther, so it must be 20 times larger since they occupy about the same area in the sky. This was the right idea, though the sun is actually about 400 times more distant than the moon. Aristarchus then used lunar eclipses and the size of Earth's shadow compared to the moon to determine that the Earth was about three times bigger than the moon. It's actually closer to four, but he was not too far off. Thus, he thought the sun must be about seven times larger than the Earth, but it's actually more like a hundred times larger. Aristarchus had the idea that stars are other suns just so far away that we can't observe parallax. Parallax refers to the difference in angle that would be observed from, for example, different sides of Earth's orbit. You can get an idea for parallax with both of your eyes. If you just, if you look at your finger with one eye closed, and then you look at it with the other eye closed, and see the background, what's behind your finger changes. That is an example of parallax. And we should observe that if the Earth is orbiting the Sun. That was the idea. Why don't we observe a difference in angle 
well, the stars are a lot further away than most of the Greeks thought. Seleucus of Seleucia, who lived from about 190 BC to 150 BC, followed heliocentrism and supposedly used reason to demonstrate it, but we don't know what his argument was. Around this time lived Archimedes, one of the greatest scientists of antiquity. He worked with simple machines and weaponized devices in the siege of Syracuse. He is known especially for his Eureka moment, when he realized he could determine the volume of an irregularly shaped object. The principle is that a body immersed in a fluid experiences a buoyant force equal to the weight of the fluid it displaces. Archimedes was a great mathematician, even a forerunner of calculus. He approximated the value of pi. He made contributions to studies on conic sections. He determined equations to find the area of a circle and of a parabola when you cut it off with a straight line. In the Sand Reckoner, he sets out to calculate the number of grains of sand that the universe could contain and he finds that it's about eight times 10 to the 63. Next, we have Eratosthenes of Cyrene, who worked at the library at Alexandria. He was able to calculate an amazingly accurate estimate of the size of the earth. He was aware that a town about 5,000 stadia south of Alexandria, the town of Syene, had a well and on the summer solstice at noon, there would be no shadow in the well. So that meant the sun was directly overhead. So at that time, when the sun was directly overhead in Syene, he measured the length of a shadow of a gnomon in Alexandria. And based on the length of the shadow, he could tell what the angular difference was between Syene and Alexandria and thus determine the size of the Earth. He found that this angle was about seven degrees or one fiftieth of a circle. So the distance from Syene to Alexandria was about one fiftieth the circumference of the Earth. We don't have a definite value that a stadium was, but his result was perhaps 39,375 kilometers in today's units. And that's only 1.4% less than the value we accept today, 40,076 kilometers. Part of the reasons he was off could have been because Syene is not directly south of Alexandria. They're not on the same meridian. Syene was also not exactly on the Tropic of Cancer. So the sun wouldn't have been exactly overhead at noon. And also the value he used for the distance between Syene and Alexandria would have been an approximation as well. Apollonius of Perga also made important contributions to conic sections. In his astronomical model, he introduced two new mechanisms that could explain how the planets vary in distance and speed. One is the eccentric deferent. The deferent is the circle that carries the planet around the Earth. And eccentric here means that it is slightly off-center from Earth. In the deferent and epicycle mechanism, the deferent carries a smaller circle, the epicycle, which carries the planet. Apollonius's theorem shows that the deferent and epicycle model can mimic the eccentric model, and thus either could explain retrograde motion. Last, we come to Hipparchus of Nicaea. He further developed the model of the eccentric circle with an epicycle. Hipparchus was the first to measure the precession of the equinoxes, which is a 26,000 year cycle. It's what makes our North Star the North Star today, but will not always be the North Star and has not always been the North Star. Hipparchus made a star catalog with a system of apparent magnitudes, that is how bright the stars are. He classified some as the first rank stars, so they would have a magnitude of one, then the 
group of stars that were the next brightest after the first magnitude stars would be the second magnitude stars and so on and so forth to about sixth magnitude is barely visible to the naked eye. We still use the magnitude system today, though it is now measured and for magnitudes that are even brighter than first magnitude, we use negative numbers, so it's a bit more complicated. Hipparchus made the first trigonometric table. He possibly invented the astrolabe and could have also been the first one to have a reliable method to predict solar eclipses. We can't end our discussion of Greek astronomy without talking about the Antikythera mechanism. This was a device for calculating the motions of the sun and moon and possibly the planets. And it could produce calculations for the metonic and calypic cycles. This Antikythera mechanism was found in 1902 and is on display in Athens at the museum. This one that was discovered dates back to between 150 and 100 BC, but there are references to similar devices that could have existed even centuries before this. So the Greeks were pretty amazing. They discovered a lot about astronomy without even using a telescope. And we, so we need to give them a lot of credit.